Welcome to a special public lecture event in coordination with the Tohoku uh, Forum for Creativity and Berlin Science Week. And I think you can, hopefully you can see my screen. And um, so it's uh, my honor to be the moderator for today's event. Good morning or good evening to all of our participants, wherever you are. And today's pre-event is called Learning from Disasters for a Resilient Society, Experiences from the Great East Japan Earthquake and Tsunami and COVID-19 Pandemic. And before we start, I would like to just give a little bit of an overview of today's program schedule. So after we first have our welcome address, welcome message from Professor Imamura of Iridesu of Tohoku University, we will then have four presentations. And our first presentation will be from Professor Egawa from Tohoku University entitled Healthy Society is Resilient Against Disaster, followed by our second presentation from Verena Blechinder Talcott from Free University of Berlin entitled Building Resilient International Networks. Our third presentation will be from Yulia Gerster from Tohoku University entitled School Memorials and Disaster Risk Education After the 2011 Great East Japan Earthquake. And our final presentation will be presented by two colleagues from Free University of Berlin, Daniel Lorenz and Martin Voss, uh, entitled The Variety of Resilient Societies. Following the four presentations, we will have a discussion session that will be moderated by um, Sebastian Bure from Tohoku University and final closing remarks from um, Anuat from Suparsri from Tohoku University. And we really encourage everyone to participate and you may submit your questions through the chat function or through the Q&A function as well. And we look forward to having a great discussion between our colleagues at Free University of Berlin and Tohoku University. So now it's my pleasure to invite Professor Fumihiko Imamura, uh, Professor of Tohoku University and also the Director of, of EDDES to give us a welcome address. Please go ahead, Professor Imamura. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the, this event. Uh, I am the Fumihiko Imamura, Director of the EDDES Tohoku University. At the beginning of the, this session or panel, I would like to say a few words. This is the joint pre-event collaboration with the Berlin Science Week. It is great. And which topics is the learning from the disasters for resilient society through the sharing a lesson and experiences from the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake tsunami or recent natural disaster and COVID-19 pandemic. Almost 10 years ago, we have the experienced natural disasters that caused huge damages, which never experienced in the before in Japan. And now at the reconstruction process. And unfortunately, other natural disasters, such as flood, fires, volcanoes, and eruption has continuously happened in the world. And also all country, are now fighting with the COVID-19 pandemic. How we can learn from the, this event and how we can reduce the uh, influence. So this is why we organize the joint panel with the Japanese and the German expertise to discuss disaster medicine, international relation, legend society and the disaster memories. Today, we have a good combination to talk from Tohoku University, Japan, and to talk from the Free University of Berlin in Germany. So having experienced the catastrophic disaster in 2011, uh, Tohoku University has founded the new research institute for disaster sciences, IRIDES, and expert scholar from 13 fields who shared high ideas and a strong sense of the agency came together in seven division from both humanities, human social sciences and natural sciences to participate in the multidisciplinary and multi layered approach to lead study of the disaster sciences. 
And now, the new collaboration with German and other countries has not only contribution contribute as a main driver to research and the social support of the local community in the disaster affected area, but also being reaching out to international community toward building disaster legend city and society. We hope this session and panel will be meaningful meeting for all of you and enhance the collaboration among German and Japan and other countries. Thank you very much. Looking forward. Thank you very much, Professor Imamura. So now we are going to move to the presentations and discussion uh, phase of our lecture series. And our first presentation will be from Shinichi Egawa from EDDS of Tohoku University. So Professor Egawa um, has been a professor of international cooperation for disaster medicine at EDDS since 2012. Professor Egawa is a medical doctor and a surgeon who specializes in the pancreas. He served as the headquarters of Tohoku University Hospital at the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. And his research specialty is disaster medic medicine, medical needs, and effective response after the disaster. Don't, go ahead, Professor Egal. We're looking forward to your speech. Uh, today's my topic is about uh, health and disaster. As uh, for the first introduction, I'd like to introduce the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And before going to uh, going into the international framework, I'd like to explain uh, the similarity between the disease and disaster. Because I am a medical doctor, as introduced, the human beings uh, get the disease with the uh, characteristics of the body, the genetic genetic factor and the environmental factor, including the tobacco smoking or uh, some uh, food or environmental toxi toxins. And now the uh, COVID-19 came into our environment. And the outcome of these two factors uh, becomes the disease. Then the disaster is the same. The hazards like earthquake, tsunami, or tornado, uh, typhoon, the tropic cyclones, and the Ebola virus, and the radiation and the nuclear accident, and also the COVID-19 is a hazard, called hazard. Hazards require the body to affect. So the body means the community. The community has a vulnerability and capacity, and the outcome of these interactions becomes the disaster. So the international framework main principle is know your risk, reduce your risk and prepare to act. In order to make the disaster risk smaller, please make the, uh, the upper side smaller and make the downside, lower side larger so that the risk becomes much smaller. This is a basic concept of the disaster risk reduction. So when you think about the uh, risk reduction, of the COVID-19 as a disaster makes a smaller hazard and exposure. So far, the COVID-19 can be, uh, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 can be sanitized using the alcohol gel and uh, we can reduce the exposure to the hazard by wearing masks and physical distancing and avoid three Cs closed spaces, crowded spaces, and closed content settings. And also make the vulnerability smaller, less comorbidity. That means the healthy body and protect vulnerable population, especially the older population are vulnerable. So we have to protect the welfare facility where the, most of the older people are living in Japan. And larger capacity, uh, it contains the government leadership, advocacy, communication capability, and also individual coping capacity, altruism, and medical service coordination. Then the risk can be smaller. And this is a history of the international uh, framework for the disaster risk reduction. 
when the uh, disaster happens, the international community uh, made a uh, rescue activity to the Caribbean Sea or earthquake in Yugoslavia or uh, Iran. And uh, Global Assembly for more preparedness is more effective than response so that uh, the United Nations established the Disaster Relief Office. But the, in any way, the response is necessary after disaster happens. So this is like a treatment after disease development. But uh, the international community uh, changed their way to spend more effort in the prevention, like preparedness. And uh, the 1918 international decade and the 1994 Yokohama strategy, 1999, the ISDS, and uh, created the International Office for the Disaster Risk Reduction. And in 1995, the human security concept was introduced into the United Nations. And in 2005, uh, there was an, also a second world conference for the disaster risk reduction in Kobe city. And, uh, and the framework was named Hyogo Framework for Action. Before Hyogo, it was Yokohama strategy and plans of action. And in 2005, Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction was adopted by more than 180 countries, member states of the United Nations. And uh, at the same year, the Paris Agreement and also the Sustainable Goal Development Goals were adopted. This is the main framework of the Sendai Framework. And the Sendai Framework has four priorities. So understand the disaster risk and the disaster risk governance. And thirdly, investment in disaster risk reduction. And fourthly, uh, enhance preparedness. And uh, it's a very good, important idea that build back better in recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. So that there are seven global targets by implementing these E, F, and G goals, the national local strategies, international corporations, early warning system that reduce the mortality of number of affected people, direct economic loss, and infrastructure as an outcome. So these are the what the Sendai Framework work is telling. But I am a medical doctor and uh, I searched the number of words health in the frameworks. The Yokohama strategy doesn't have any word of health. The Hyogo framework had three words of health. And the Sendai framework has 34 words of health. Because Sendai framework has described for the first time that disaster affects health of the people. It is very natural. Everyone thinks, everyone thinks that disaster affects the health, but the international framework didn't mention that. Sendai frameworks therefore aims to reduce disaster loss with significant economic, social, health, cultural, and environmental impact. Why? Because health is so important. And I compared the, uh, the risk index uh, public, uh, published by the uh, European unions and also the uh, DRR office that risk has uh, three dimensions, hazard and exposure, vulnerability, and lack of coping capacity. This is a negative, negative of the coping capacity. And these red ones has a health aspect. And when we compare the life expectancy of the member nations with the informed risk index, that it's very, very uh, strongly correlates negatively. Japan has a long life expectancy, but has low inf disaster risk. But Japan has high hazard and exposure risk. As you know, Japan has high frequency of the earthquakes and tornado, uh, tropical cyclones, tropical uh, typhoons. But Japan has low vulnerability and Japan has low risk of lacking co lack of coping capacity. That means Japan has high coping capacity. And when we compare the natural hazard risk and life expectancy, very, very uh, interestingly, that when earthquakes and tsunami and tropical cyclones these 
hazards has a positive correlation with the life expectancy. So this can be a kind of one-time incident. One-time incident. However, when we when you have a high risk of drought or flood, this uh, these types of hazards has a negative effect in the life expectancy. And also the health related categories of informed risk index and life expectancy is shown here. So when you can Im easily imagine that when you have the human development, low human development index, you have a high uh, disaster risk. And also, uh, and the low these uh, social determinant of the health, you have the long life expectancy and low uh, vulnerability in terms of this socioeconomic aspect. And children under five, when you have high index of the children under five mortality or malnutrition, uh, you have the high risk of disaster. And lack of access to healthcare, so that Japan has good access to healthcare. But when we think about the real situation, the disaster is different one by one. In Kobe, uh, Hanshin Awaja earthquake in 1995, most of the cause of the death is by the collapse of the buildings. And also fire killed many people. So the Japanese changed, government changed the building code that the building should be upgrade proof. And also uh, this is a beginning of the Japanese Association for Disaster Medicine. And this is a 20, 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. And I'd like to uh, show you some part of the video. And, but uh, if you want to, do not want to see, do not see. So this is a video of tsunami. These tsunami affected, and I don't have time, so because so I will skip many parts, but that tsunami destroys everything like this. So the people were stayed in the rooftop of the four-story building, but the water is coming to the four-story building top, so that people are afraid of the tsunami and going up and up. And the 93% of the death was drowning. When you compare the real ener energy magnitude of the Hanshin Awaja earthquake in 1995 and a Great East Japan earthquake 2011, the magnitude was 7.3 and 9.0. But the M9.0 is 350 times stronger than the Hanshin Awaja earthquake. However, if you compare the number of injured people, 43,000 people were injured in the Hanshin Awaja earthquake by the collapse of the buildings and houses. However, 6,000 people got injured. This is the kind of victory of the disaster risk reduction of the architecture. However, we had more death by the tsunami. But as a medical doctor, we faced the less injury, but the different medical needs lasted longer, which lasted longer. And the disruption of traffic and communication, mental health sector paralyzed. And uh, as you know, the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident was complicated. Mental health of affected people was devastated. The mental health aspect of the disaster medicine was developed by the uh, experience of 1995 and the health facilities were also destroyed by disaster. Education of disaster medicine was not generalized in health professionals. I wrote, uh, uh, recently I wrote this paper in the WHO guidebook for the uh, research uh, in the health emergency and disaster risk management. This article indicates the history of Japanese development of the disaster medicine using the uh, awareing the history of the tsunami in the world and also uh, the history of the di uh, natural disasters in Japan and the implement of the law. And after, after 2011 Great East Japan earthquake, we improved the existing the national disaster medical system the, before 2011 uh, like this. 
in the experience of Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake, we had a disaster-based hospital, disaster medical assistant team named DMAT, and the staging care unit and wide area transportation. The information sharing was used by this EMIS. However, the many things, um, unmatched needs uh, created us to be aware that uh, we have still gap in the disaster medical system. So the disaster medical coordinator, psychiatric assistant team called DPAT, health emergency assistant team called DHEAT, disaster rehabilitation assistant team, JRAT, and mother child health liaison, and hemodialysis liaison, and the JSPEED system, uh, which is a disease surveillance after disaster. So that this is a very important concept that building but better and disaster risk reduction is so important. If you do not have a building but better concept, the second attack of the disaster will have a worse outcome. So the take home message of today that every disaster is different but affects the health of the people. Know your risk, reduce your risk, and prepare to act is the backbone of DRR frameworks. But DRR is not achievable without health promotion of the society. So the helping at the time of emergency is not the real helping. You have to help every time. And Japan is continuing to build but better after disasters like GEJE and COVID-19. So the conclusion, the healthy society is resilient against disaster. So, and this is a word from Mahatma Gandhi for the sustainable development goals. It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Professor Egawa, thank you so much for your um, great presentation that gave us a lot to think about, about the role of health in a resilient society. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna keep our questions for the discussion after all the presentations, but we invite everybody who has a question to ask your questions using the chat feature or using the Q&A feature um, at any time. So please feel free. And then it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Verena Blechinder Talcott is the Vice President of International Affairs, Professor of Japanese Politics and Political Economy at Free University Berlin in Germany. From 2012 into 2020, she also was the founding director of the Graduate School of East Asian Studies, which was funded by the German federal government's Excellence Initiative. Her research interests include Japanese politics in comparative perspective, international change in Japanese politics, and government business relations in both domestic politics and international relations. Building resilient and sustainable international networks is one of her core responsibilities, not only as Vice President of International Affairs during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, but also through her various international engagements during other times of crisis, such as the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. So please go ahead, Verena. Thank you very much, Liz, for the kind introduction. And um, I'm quite excited to be a part of the panel here. I will share my screen. And um, my talk today is a little different maybe from uh, the other panelists because I am not an expert in disaster research as I was just introduced. I'm a political scientist um, focusing on East Asia um, with a strong interest in institutions, their um, origins, their effects and um, their international uh, interdependencies. And I'm also on the panel here today um, as a kind of practitioner because I'm, uh, I've been involved in um, doing international uh, network work in, um, in academia uh, between Germany and Japan, between Europe and Japan, and um, since 2018 as Vice President of the University, also between Freie Universität Berlin and Partners Worldwide. Um, and so when I was asked to join this panel, uh, which I am very excited about, um, I thought I uh, used the experience um, as, a, as a practitioner in international networks with the uh, interest in institutions and share my thoughts on how we could build resilient international networks in times of uh, disaster. 
So what am I going to do? Um, I am, let me just see here, go to my next slide. Um, I will first share a few thoughts about uh, resilience and international networks. And then I will draw on experiences we had here um, in Berlin uh, with regards to German Japanese networks, uh, both in the context of the uh, 2011 East Japan earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster. And then also in the context of COVID-19. Um, so why should we care about resilience in international networks? Um, there are several levels that are important, and um, I think the presentation by uh, Professor Egawa just uh, before mine showed already that um, prevention and preparedness is a very important aspect for uh, society to cope with disasters, to overcome disasters. So that is certainly one part of resilience. If one um, is prepared, if institutional uh, if institutions are in place that help uh, preparedness, then uh, even if disaster struck, struck one is um, more uh, ready to engage with disaster, societies and networks can, um, can, can persist and uh, the disruptive effects of disaster can be minimized. A second very important effect of uh, resilience is the ability to recover. Um, that's where the, the term originally comes from, from engineering resilient structures or such that bounce back, even if they um, are hit by an external shock, they bounce back and they uh, keep their original um, uh, state. So in that way, uh, ability to recover could mean either returning to the previous state or to adjust and adapt to a new situation that was brought about by disaster or just to keep up functionality and to uh, continue um, a network structure, even in times of massive internal or external shock. And the third part is more a psychological effect um, of, um, of resilience, that is um, resilient structures have the capacity to adapt to or cope with risks and uncertainty. So the idea here is, to live with risks, to be ready uh, for, un to, for, for uncertain events to, to happen and to be prepared to have strategies in place. So this is why resilience is important. When we look at building international networks, we want to be prepared. Um, we want to be able to overcome external shocks or internal shocks to be able to function even in times of uh, disaster. And uh, we want to um, be able to function in an efficient way, even in times of high risk or high insecurity, so that the core of the network can continue to go on. Now, I already said I'm a political scientist who's interested in institutions and institutions are usually there um, in order to minimize risks, in order to um, enhance um, predictability, in order to provide stability and in order to reduce, if you want to argue from an, an economic perspective, to reduce transaction costs. So if we build a network, we have uh, certain practices in place of interaction. Um, we usually have networks set up as uh, formal institutions. So there are contracts, there are agreements. So there is a, a legalization of the cooperation and um, we have established practices. And at the same time, we usually also, if we work together for a longer time in an international network, we also have a story to tell. We have some um, norms, some values that bind us us and they are built through past experiences and the collective memory of all network partners um, about these past experiences. So it's practice, but it's also the, um, the joint story, the value attached to this practice that matters in order to uh, build a resilient network. And I would say that the degree of resilience depends on decisions and strategies made by political and social actors during what we call critical junctures. So in times of crisis, in times of high uncertainty, this is where actors set the path towards a resilience in the institution, in the network, 
or to, um, to open up the network to higher degrees of insecurity. So why should we study resilience in international networks? Just in general, we are working together on a global scale, increasingly so, and globalization increases vulnerability. International networks are susceptible to endogenous or external shocks, and that is true for all kinds of international networks that we're looking at. International organizations and multilateral treaties are susceptible to shocks the same way as global trade networks and value change, information and knowledge circulation or infrastructure networks. Uh, examples for that um, could be uh, disasters that um, in, in, in the old days before we had these global networks of collaboration and cooperation were locally confined and um, affected infrastructure, affected um, uh, communication networks. But now since they are part of a larger international network, they also affect people and institutions in other parts of the world. So in that way, um, the more globally uh, we are active, the higher our vulnerability to disasters and therefore the higher the need for resilience in international networks. So I want to talk about, as I said, my practical experience and um, the practical experience that I'm bringing in is um, the leading function in international networks in research and teaching, especially between Germany and Japan involving exchange of students and researchers, but also cooperation in international uh, scholarly uh, organizations, organizing of large scale international conferences and research projects. So let's see how um, these international networks in research and teaching have been affected by the two disasters we are talking about today, the Great East Japan earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster on the one hand, and the COVID-19, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic on the other hand. Um, in the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami and the uh, following nuclear disaster in consequence of the accident in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant um, were characterized by the fact that our networks were um, very strongly affected by a sudden shock. I still remember, and I think everyone in German-Japanese relations remembers where he or she was uh, when we first heard of the, of the news of this massive earthquake and the tsunami, where we saw the images that uh, Professor Egawe had just uh, shared in his presentation. And when we were worried about our friends and network partners, colleagues, um, and, and family members who were uh, in the affected areas in the Northeast of uh, Japan. So there was a sudden shock that was also uh, linked with a high level of insecurity. Um, for us at Freie Universität Berlin, it definitely meant we had at the time about uh, 35 of our students in Japan, um, most of them in the Tokyo region and then also uh, north of Tokyo towards the Tohoku region. And the first question was, is everyone safe? Um, and where should our students go? Um, there was a great interest uh, also from the side of the media, both in uh, Germany, but also internationally. And then with the moment that uh, there was also the debate about uh, nuclear disaster and uh, potential risk of uh, rupture in the Fukushima nuclear power plant, there was also um, international attention uh, to that. Uh, that led to the fact that many organizations very quickly withdrew their international personnel. Um, one uh, still remembers the uh, images of um, diplomats leaving Tokyo, I think, except for the British ambassador. Uh, all other uh, international missions uh, were closed. People left uh, either for the Kansai region in the west of Japan or left Japan altogether. Um, the German school in Tokyo, um, students returned from uh, spring vacation, teachers were no longer there, many of their classmates were no longer there, there was no 
um, not much in, in terms of communication. And it was uh, very quickly leading to uh, different discourses. On the one hand, we had a discourse in, in Japan, also on the side of our uh, Japanese partners who felt betrayed and left behind by their international colleagues. Um, and on the other hand, there was an international discourse about safety, security, um, and, and also the, uh, the, the, the question of how, how, to, how to handle the situation from then on, especially in the Tohoku region, there was also massive damage to infrastructure, uh, no train lines, no streets, no communication. Uh, so there was a high level of, of insecurity that um, led us to um, a major challenge in our relations. Um, we told our students to um, listen to our Japanese partners to uh, also report back to the partner universities uh, so that everyone knew and where they were and where they were accounted for and then uh, to take a uh, short-term leave to go uh, either to the Kansai region or to a neighboring country in East Asia. Most of our students actually went to Korea. Um, and we offered also the possibility to return uh, in case of um, mental stress and insecurity. And we would pay for the travel costs of our students. But in the end, out of the 35 students who were in Japan, only one returned, everyone else uh, returned to Germany, everyone else stayed in Japan, and then after a short period of time, um, as soon as it was possible to return to their university, they did return. Um, still, it took a long time in German-Japanese academic relations, as well as in German-Japanese relations, to overcome um, this initial um, moving out of Japan and leaving contacts behind. Uh, the word gaijin for foreigner um, was then also translated into flyjin uh, for fleeing, flying away. Um, and that was something that needed a lot of mending in uh, later on, in later stages. Um, COVID-19 is an ongoing disaster. Um, the characteristics are that there is even higher level of insecurity because we are looking at an open-ended crisis. It's not clear um, when, if and when there will be a medical solution for the, uh, the problem, whether there is a, a good treatment, whether there is a, a vaccine. Um, at the same time, we are facing um, we are facing periods of um, new infections, like currently in Germany, you see in the background, I'm uh, talking from my living room because we, because we are again in a partial lockdown. And that again led to parallel discourses of globalization on the one hand, global solidarity, let's work together, let's find a joint solution for this joint problem, but at the same time also discourses of renationalization. We had quite a number of countries and again Germany was also one of them that tried to uh, bundle resources. Um, in that case, it was masks at the beginning of the disaster, uh, keep them inside the country and therefore stopping delivery to areas in Europe that were highly affected by the disaster, such as Italy or France. Um, the United States uh, started a national campaign of buying both masks and also rights to a still to be developed uh, vaccine that would go to America first. That certainly again led to a disruption in international networks, in international discourses. And uh, for us in, in academia, the main issue was certainly the massive limitation uh, to international mobility. Student exchange more or less came uh, to a halt in the beginning, um, and we had to retool um, retarget um, how to uh, keep up international networks in research uh, with our colleagues as well as in teaching, and this time on a global scale. So what have we learned? What have we learned from both um, disasters and especially from the COVID-19 disaster? What makes international networks resilient? 
Um, first of all, I think the most important part is trust among network partners. And this trust can usually be built based on past experiences and practices in cooperation. We found that very quickly with our partner universities um, at the global level, those who have been our close partners for a long time where we have sent students for decades, um, where we had established research networks and also personal ties, personal connections to the people in charge. Um, these were the networks that still very quickly uh, started to um, regrow, to rebuild, where we went and uh, recalibrated. So uh, usually we have about a thousand students that are involved in um, mobility. Um, and out of these thousand students, about 300 um, could start their mobility in the fall this year. At the same time, um, we have uh, 700 students who were quite uh, strongly involved in virtual mobility through digital tools. So in that way, resilience is also built on infrastructure and the uh, flexibility and creativity to use infrastructure in new ways. Um, instead of physical mobility, we now have virtual mobility, which cannot necessarily 100% uh, um, replace uh, the physical exchange, but it helps to keep discussions going. It helps to get um, at least uh, insights into the structure at the partner institutions, and it helps to keep uh, cooperation alive in places where it actually is already built. And communication is a very important tool here. During the 2011 um, Great Japan, East Japan earthquake and tsunami, um, social media have become incredibly important. Before, it was not necessarily a thing for us at a as a university institute to actively use social media. But um, after the high level of insecurity, where are our students, where are our colleagues, is everyone safe? Um, Facebook helped and um, within 45 minutes I could account all uh, for all of our students who were in Japan at the time. Similarly, um, under COVID-19, communication, exchange of um, experiences, exchange of practices um, has become incredibly important for us to make the network resilience and to help it bounce back uh, to its uh, previous strengths. We have uh, digital tools um, in our European network, Una Europa, transform emergency now, where we use digital, um, jointly held digital courses to bring students from eight universities together to solve everyday problems, like how could we organize um, political participation in times of COVID and lockdown, or at the same time, virtual mobility in times of disaster. Um, talking about experiences helps, and it also helps because it is also a tool, communication is a tool to show solidarity and support. And solidarity and support needs to be at eye level, needs to be um, at the same level. It can't be, uh, we have managed something and you don't because things are changing very, very quickly. And I think that's also something we have learned. Solidarity is a virtual, uh, is a mutual process and support has to be organized mutually. So how can we do this? How can we build resilient international networks? We can use disasters and experiences of high risk and high insecurity as catalysts for our international networks, where we put uh, them to the test to see how robust they are. As I said, solidarity and support is very important. Um, shared experiences and the development of joint narratives, how we overcome, how we managed uh, already in this uh, first digital semester, this will give us strength to move forward. Investment in infrastructure and technology, both for the levels of preparedness, but also with regards to adaptation and development towards new, new cooperation, um, flexibility and creativity, being open 
being ready for at times of insecurity um, to, to change the ways we are interacting um, and being open for new modes of cooperation. We also see that in, in international academia, digital courses, opening uh, lectures for students from other campuses would have been unthinkable just about one year ago or would have been a highly innovative project. And now it's everyday practice, everyone does it. And that shows how quickly we can actually um, uh, adjust. And the last part is to, read, to be ready to cope with resistance. Even if you go for um, new um, ways of cooperation, even if you um, build on established international networks, be ready to cope with resistance, both internally uh, when it comes to resources. Don't we have more important things to do now? Don't we have to protect our country, our institution first? These are topics that come up at times of uh, disaster that are a challenge for international networks. And on the other hand, externally um, by um, authorities that uh, close, tend to close borders, tend to reduce or bundle resources. So in that way, um, be ready to cope with resistance, both internally and externally is I think another very important part. And this concludes my uh, remarks. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Verena. It's giving us so much to think about and so important as we figure out how to deal with the situation where we're here in Zoom. And I look forward to your, utilizing your expertise to strengthen the collaboration between our institutions. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our third presenter. Uh, Yulia Gerster received a PhD in Japanese studies with a disciplinary focus in cultural anthropology at Free University of Berlin. Since 2019, she's been working as an assistant professor at the International Research Institute of Disaster Science EDS here at Tohoku University. Her main research interests include the dynamics of social relations after disasters, recovery processes, the handling of negative heritage, as well as identity and community building. Go ahead, Julia. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also thank you to everyone attending today's session. Um, I'm going to share my slides. And yes. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about school memorials and disaster risk education after the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and uh, also about the connection um, with resilience. So um, yeah, we have heard quite a lot about the Great East Japan earthquake already. And I think most of you uh, remember the 11th of March, 2011, when um, the earthquake, the tsunami and the nuclear disaster happened in Northeast Japan. Um, yeah, about 20,000 people lost their life in these disasters and more than 350,000 uh, people were displaced. And uh, even today, so almost 10 years after the disaster, more than 40,000 uh, people cannot return home. And this is uh, only the number of the official evacuees. So there are actually uh, many more. So what do these uh, disaster affected areas look like today? Um, most of the coastal communities have been relocated to higher ground. And uh, most of the tsunami inundated areas have been declared as uh, tsunami hazard zones. So actually, um, yeah, vast areas cannot be uh, rebuilt for um, yeah, housing anymore because of the risk of uh, other tsunamis happening in the future. And um, yeah, we should also not forget that uh, there are still several communities um, part of the nuclear exclusion zone in Fukushima prefecture. And um, the picture on the right side uh, on the bottom actually shows like one of the reopened areas. Um, of course, not all of the reopened uh, towns in Fukushima prefecture look like this, but uh, since not um, all the former residents decided to come back, like in between the residential areas, uh, you would always see um, some of the houses where people decided not to return, but also uh, don't want to tear down their uh, former property. 
So um, especially in the tsunami hazard zones, um, so there's basically uh, lots of space that cannot be used for housing anymore. And instead, um, it has been decided that so-called uh, recovery parks should be constructed there also to memorialize um, the disasters that happened 10 years ago. And within these parks and uh, also in other areas, um, there are often uh, buildings that show the impact of the earthquake and the tsunami. And uh, some of them um, yeah, are preserved uh, yeah, to keep telling the stories of, of what happened that day. So such sites can be called negative heritage. And negative heritage has been um, yeah, described as a conflictual site that becomes the repository of negative memory in the collective imaginary. As a site of memory, negative her heritage occupies a dual role. So it can be mobilized for positive didactic purposes or alternatively be erased if such places cannot be culturally rehabilitated and thus resist incorporation into the national imaginary. So um, yes, we also know from war heritage, for example, not, uh, yeah, not everything would be preserved to uh, tell lessons about uh, what happened during the war and what not uh, to repeat again. So after the Great East Japan earthquake, the significance of uh, yeah, preserving negative heritage has actually been um, yeah, stressed in the seven principles for, recon uh, for the reconstruction framework. And the first principle already says that for us, the surviving, there is no other starting point for the path to recovery than to remember and honor the many lives that have been lost. Accordingly, we shall record the disaster for eternity, including through the creation of memorial forests and monuments, and we shall have the disaster scientifically analyzed by a broad range of scholars to draw lessons that will be shared with the world and passed down to posterity. However, um, of course, not everything can be preserved. And you can imagine that um, after the tsunami, um, there were like thousands of uh, damaged buildings in the coastal area. So if, uh, if everything would have been left as it was, um, as a memorial, for example, um, that would basically mean that you cannot uh, face reconstruction. And uh, what's also important to note is that um, preservation decisions um, can also lead to frictions among community members as for some people, um, it is yeah very important to to keep, the, to, uh, to keep the buildings where their relatives or loved ones died is uh, to remember them and also to remember the legacy. But on the other hand, there are also many people who simply cannot bear to see these buildings anymore. But um, yeah, as also pointed out by the seven principles, um, yeah, sites of negative heritage can be used to remind of past disasters and imminent ha hazards. And by doing so, uh, we can also learn um, from the past and prepare ourselves. And um, yeah, this can ultimately uh, yeah, contribute to resilience. And um, it has also been pointed out that the preservation of disaster ruins can make a positive contribution to mental and social recovery. I think this has been also touched upon by uh, Verena in her presentation um, when she mentioned communication. So here, uh, these sites of negative heritage also become places where survivors can share their experiences and can talk about um, yeah, what had happened in the region, but also kind of connect to the past by um, telling people about what the area used to look like before. So today I'm going to talk about um, school disaster memorials in Miyagi Prefecture. Um, actually, there are many more um, schools that have been hit by the tsunami in 2011 um, and that have been preserved. But today I'm only uh, going to talk about three of them and um, yeah, to basically discuss uh, how uh, even in this one disaster, um, facilities kind of try to deal uh, with the disaster differently and try to tell um, or convey the lessons learned from the disaster in different ways. So the first is Arahama Elementary in Sendai City. Um, Arahama Elementary is located only 700 meters away from the coast. And uh, in that area, about 2,200 people used to live. In, uh, yeah, 
and as you can see on the picture, um, uh, yeah, so the area was basically completed, uh, completely flooded. But luckily, about uh, 320 people were saved because they evacuated to the school and um, also evacuated on the rooftop. So in 2017, the memorial was, um, yeah, the school was reopened as a memorial and now um, host a permanent and also temporary exhibitions, not only uh, talking about what the area used to look like before the disaster, but um, it also became a place where people can familiarize themselves with um, emergency goods, for example. So uh, these are pictures of the area just a couple of days after the um, tsunami hit the place. And um, so basically most of the coastal areas in Northeast Japan looked like this. In um, Adahama Elementary, the exhibitions are a combination of what life used to be before the disaster and then also disaster risk education. For example, um, on one floor, um, people can see what kind of blankets the students used, uh, how they had to share blankets because they were not enough. Uh, they can take a look at uh, emergency food, for example, uh, and ask uh, the guides about preparations and um, kind of yeah, familiarize themselves with uh, what, they, what you need to prepare in case of another disaster. And um, the exhibition itself, um, kind of uh, yeah, has the visitors enter the school and um, the, but the debris in the school has been cleared, but you have pictures on the wall that kind of remind of uh, what, the, what the place looked like uh, right after the disaster. So another example of uh, good evac evacuation practice um, is Nakahama Elementary. So that's, uh, that's a elementary school in Yamamoto town, um, which is also in Miyagi prefecture. And uh, that school has been built in 1989. And uh, already uh, at the time when it was built, uh, disaster preparedness was integrated in, uh, yeah, in building the school. So uh, as you can see on the picture, the ground level was raised uh, by two meters and there's also an evacuation staircase outside of the school so that uh, local, uh, yeah, local people could evacuate um, to the school and uh, to the rooftop of the school even uh, on the weekend when the school would be closed. And Nakahama Elementary is only 400 meters away from the coast and 90 people were saved on, on the rooftop because of these measures. So on that picture, you can also see a blue sign that um, shows you the height of the tsunami. So here it's important to know that um, if the ground level of the school would, uh, wouldn't have been raised by these two meters, um, it would have been likely that uh, the children would be trapped on the rooftop since there's no other higher place to evacuate from there. So the approach of um, the exhibitions at Nakahama Elementary is to let people think about disaster preparedness. So um, unlike Arahama Elementary, the visitors are not presented with um, a straight or with a clear story of good practices and what to do in case of a, of, of a disaster. And the guides actually stress that um, the situation could be different uh, depending on the location and depending uh, on the type of disaster. So again, if, uh, if the tsunami would have been higher, then uh, the children could have been trapped on, um, yeah, at the school. So uh, on the one hand, guides would uh, kind of stress the lucky coincidences that led um, yeah, to, the, uh, to saving uh, the 90 people who evacuated there. But on uh, the other hand, the school is now also used to um, yeah, encourage people to engage with disaster preparedness. So for instance, um, there would be several interactive uh, panels where people have to guess how many meters um, away from the, from the coast is the school located, uh, how much time do you think the tsunami uh, yeah, took to arrive at the school and things like that. And um, by coming to the school area, uh, the visitors um, learn about risk education through emotions um, because they, uh, they get told the story of the children who uh, evacuated there. And um, 
they kind of go through the evacuation process with the guide as well. So the last, the last example I want to talk about is Okawa Elementary in Ishinomaki City. And Okawa Elementary might be the most tragic example of um, yeah, disaster, uh, like school disaster ruins after the Great East Japan earthquake. So um, that school is located four kilometers away from the coast. Uh, so actually uh, it's much further away from the coast um, compared to the other two schools, but it's very close to a river and that river um, happened to carry the tsunami upstream um, so that the school grounds were flooded um, yeah, when it arrived. And this led to the death of uh, 74 children and 10 um, school staff. So uh, what's even more tragic about this example is that um, the school is right next to a little hill and I took that picture from that hill and uh, it said that uh, it would have taken the students maybe about uh, seven minutes to evacuate to the hill but this, the teachers were not, yeah, were kind of worried that they might trip or that uh, some injuries could occur so they uh, evacuated way too late and also in, in the direction of the incoming tsunami as they couldn't see it. And um, yeah, another problem was that although there was an evacuation manual, that manual actually didn't name a certain place uh, where people should evacuate to in case of a tsunami. So there was a long debate about whether to deserve, uh, whether to preserve um, Okawa Elementary School or not. And uh, also the local community was split about the decision as uh, this school also somehow became a place of shame since uh, no other school lost that many children in attendance of their teachers um, yeah, in 2011. And, but at the same time, a group of uh, bereaved parents started to conduct guided tours around the school and um, encouraged people to come there and to learn uh, especially about the mistakes that have been um, done there in order not to repeat this again. And uh, yeah, so in that sense, um, in the middle of uh, these many examples of schools that have been preserved uh, after the Great East Japan earthquake, Okawa Elementary is one of um, the very few places that uh, actually became so strongly connected to death and in, in such a sense also a negative example of uh, evacuation practice. But here the uh, bereaved parents always emphasize that uh, it is because of uh, these happenings that this place has to be preserved in order to not repeat uh, these mistakes again. So uh, to conclude, um, yeah, as I said before, it's almost 10 years after the Great East Japan earthquake. And even in Japan, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep uh, the memories about that day alive. Certainly not so in, uh, in the Tohoku region that was uh, severely affected. But uh, as you know, Japan is prone to many disasters and uh, many, many things uh, happen all the time. But uh, here it is, uh, yeah, it is very important to not forget what has happened on that day. And in that sense, um, these schools somehow also remain sites of learning. And as we have seen, um, although uh, all, all the three examples have been affected by the tsunami, the way the stories and um, yeah, the stories about that day and about the decisions that have been taken on that day are told are very different uh, depending on the place. And uh, these, lessons are conveyed in an emotional way. And I think this um, kind of affects the visitors also in a different way than uh, learning from a textbook. So uh, what do we learn from, from this about COVID-19? Um, I think also in the current pandemic, it is, it is very important to um, preserve the memories. And even if it's only like everyday memories that might not seem very important right now, um, I guess there is a need to discuss what has happened or what is still happening right now also in the future. And I know that uh, in Germany, but also in many other countries all over the world, uh, like there are many initiatives now that start to collect um, yeah, memories and, uh, and objects that kind of remind us of what is happening right now.
So yeah, thank you very much. And I'm also looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Yulia. Um, I just want to remind people you can, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them by chat or the Q&A function. And in case we don't have a chance to um, discuss them in the discussion, we can also reply to you at a later uh, point. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the presenters of our last presentation, which is two of our colleagues from the Free University of Berlin. Uh, Daniel Lawrence is a social scientist and senior researcher at the Disaster Research Institute at Free University of Berlin in Germany. He has conducted empirical research, for instance, in Germany, India, Japan, South Korea, Sierra Leone, Portugal, and Greece. His research interests include various social science issues in the context of disasters and humanitarian emergencies, such as social vulnerability and resilience. And the presentation will also be joined by Martin Voss, who is an inter and transdisciplinary working sociologist, university professor for social scientific disaster research, the head of the disaster research unit at the Free University of Berlin, Germany, and CEO of the nonprofit company Academy of the Disaster Research Unit, ADRU. His areas of specialization encompass the whole disaster management cycle, beginning with the perception of existential risks and ending with sustainable practices to secure well being. Please go ahead. Thank you, Liz. And I will share my slides. I can, you can see it right now give me a second please and i can see you again also so i start my presentation here many thanks again for this uh, kind introduction um i start uh, with the concept of resilience quickly but i will hand over to my colleague daniel later on he will go more in depth into this specific concept and term but um I will go more into the counter term or the sister term vulnerability first. Over the last years, the term resilience has become a core concept and we heard a lot about it already uh, in the first presentations. It's a core concept in multiple um, different fields and disciplines ranging from psychological research on survivors of the Nazi concentration camps like Auschwitz to living labs aiming very, very concretely to increase the resilience of a specific ecosystem. Even engineers make use of the term when talking about the robustness of a robot, for instance. Thumbing up the status of the mainstream debates about the concept of resilience, one can get the impression that resilience is something that can easily be produced or by churning some screws. We argue instead that this dominant understanding of resilience is, at least for the domain of social sciences, and if we're talking about the complexity of disasters as social processes, far too simplistic and may rather lead into more pro problems in a long-term perspective than reducing them. Sorry. So as human beings, we are as unfortunate as this is not resilient at all. We rather uh, are very vulnerable beings as we all will most likely die. Before Daniel will go a bit more in depth into the concept as set of resilience, let me just please start with a short explanation of the sister term, the concept of vulnerability. It is our luck that we did not live 65 million years ago when a meteorite hit the earth, but mankind has already experienced catastrophes that had indeed the power to threaten the species as such. The eruption of a volcano, for instance, can affect life on our whole planet. So-called volcanic winters can cause decline in food production and ultimately famines, as it was the case, uh, for instance, in the year 1816 after the eruption of Mount Tambora with an estimation of 50,000 casualties in Indonesia alone. So this is also to highlight and to emphasize that uh, the current pandemic is not the worst case that we should fear um, there are other black swans, as we say, outside. So we are, are vulnerable, as we do, still do not have all hazards uh, under our control. But mankind has already experienced, sorry, there is one. But we are more capable to influence the hazards, uh, where we are more capable to influence the hazard, some are more vulnerable than others. 
during the ongoing pandemic, we all learned a lot about inequalities in terms of vulnerability. For instance, for most of the students studying at the Free University in Berlin, uh, we may estimate the average age of 24.7 years. The risk to die due to a coronavirus infection is below the risk to die in a traffic accident. Nothing really to fear. But for a person like me, so estimated around 30, the risk to die due to an infection with the COVID-19 virus is already one to 400. If you were asked if you would prefer to stay at home or to walk through the city knowing that the risk to die in an accident right today would be one to 400, whereas tomorrow it would be one to 29,200 as usual, how would you answer? And how would you respond if you have some kind of previous illness increasing the risk perhaps to one to 30 or just somebody in your personal surrounding like your grandfather age 83 and the likelihood to die of one to 11 whom you personally might infect. But there are two other dimensions of vulnerability, sorry. I lost a few cents and hence, as you can easily see um, by this example, none of us is a 100% resilient as we are all vulnerable, but to varying extents. Now I talked a lot about one first specific form of vulnerability, which we may name the biophysical vulnerability here. When we evaluate the communication about the current pandemic, this type of vulnerability, the biophysical plays a major role with regard to the decisions how to respond. But there is another dimension of vulnerability. Uh, actually, there are two other dim dimensions. In the year 2013, the Eastern part of Europe was struck by strong rainfalls that endured several days. In consequence, the River Elbe region experienced extreme flooding similar to those that affected the same region only 11 years earlier in the year 2002. Many people lost everything they had been working for and after experiencing the second major flooding within 11 years and as everything has been destroyed again, which they just had rebuilt, some lost all faith and trust into themselves. People developed depressions and other psychological symptoms. Alcohol became a problem. Family ties broke. Hence, being obviously, um, hence, human being obviously is vulnerable in a second dimension, which we call the psycho emotional vulnerability here. Talking about the pandemic. This psycho-emotional dimension of vulnerability was discussed within, only with a delay and never reached the same level of attention as the biophysical vulnerability. After the flooding, people in the affected region in Eastern Germany belonging to the former GDR were not only psychologically, but also somehow collectively traumatized for multiple reasons. For example, because their strong belief in public administrations and state structures derived from history was left disappointed. Experiences during the floods revived former collective traumatization and bad experiences during World War II or the floodings of 2002 and intertwined with the disappointment about the development after the collapse of the Iron Curtain. This, as we argue, addresses the third dimension of vulnerability of human being. We argue while talking about vulnerability and resilience, and Daniel will come back to this in a minute, we so far neglect that human being in general is existentially vulnerable as he relies on the capability to make sense of this pure, his pure existence. One can say, unfortunately, but perhaps it's our luck that the human species is the only species that knows about its fragility. But humans have found ways to organize themselves in a way that the multifold, multifold possible threats for their biophysical, but also their psycho-emotional existence do not appear that disturbing. This is what we call culture. Culture is what allows a human being to live a senseful life despite being existentially vulnerable. Culture is a fundament we all are relying on. 
But this fundament itself is vulnerable. Its power can erode. We call this third dimension the social cultural dimension of vulnerability. It builds the ground that makes human being overall resilient despite all vulnerabilities. Trust in religious or political institutions, as mentioned earlier, also today already, or social cohesion, for instance, are indicators for this third dimension of vulnerability, but also for resilience. And this is why I hand over to Dan Leno. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, could you stop sharing yeah, your screen? I'm, I'm trying to do so. I will take over from yeah. here. Should it work now? Uh, yes, it works. Yes. Uh, hello, also from my side. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to give this presentation. I would uh, now go on from here with our presentation. As Martin has already argued, uh, resilience can only be understood against the background of social vulnerability. And at the same time, we can only understand vulnerability if we also consider resilience. Um, there are now countless definitions of resilience. Some of the former speakers have introduced some of them. And in the following, I would like to sketch uh, our um, understanding of the term and uh, how we can make sense of it in the social sciences when it comes to disaster research. Before I introduce uh, our understanding, I would like to use these two images uh, to briefly sketch two examples of resilience as we encountered them in our research. The first example on the left side uh, shows the ethnic group of the Moken. Um, during the tsunami in the Indian Ocean in 2004, this group had almost no casualties due to their adapted way of life and due to the traditional knowledge uh, about tsunamis. In this respect, this group was remarkably resilient against the tsunami. Even though their way of life proved to be particularly vulnerable to the social changes that came after the tsunami um, in the reconstruction phase. The other example on the right side shows a resident of the other half alone. Martin already talked about the floodings in Germany of 2013, and this is a picture uh, that was taken there. So we see uh, a man in a rural region in the center of Germany after the flood of 2013. Um, it's a region where many villages were flooded after levee broke. However, some of the inhabitants of this region stayed in the flooded region, uh, despite the masses of water uh, saving others and their livestock with boats, um, thus contributing to a better response to the overall situation. As our research in the aftermath showed, especially those people who stayed in the region uh, and actively engaged in the rescue measures, uh, particularly coped well with the situation and reported uh, in a survey that they were be able to live a normal life again after the disaster. But while some of them were very resilient in psychological terms, these people also felt disenfranchised and lost trust in the state and its disaster management in the aftermath. Um, as these two examples show, the term resilience has very different meanings and contexts of use. Um, the word resilience originates orig originally from Latin, but the exact etymology of the word still remains unknown, except for translations such as bouncing back. Um, the term has been used in various contexts since then, as you can see on the picture shown. Um, the term entered disaster research around the 1980s um, and is often understood as the other side of vulnerability and is now to be found also in agreements on disaster risk reduction, as some of the former presenters have already shown. However, um, the different contexts of use, for example, in ecology and psychology, are also of significant uh, in the context of disasters, as we will argue. In ecology, resilience is defined as the ability of an ecosystem on population to persist and to recover after radical environmental changes. Research in this context has shown that ecosystems that are adaptive and flexible uh, 
when it comes to environmental change are very resilient. Similar ideas can be found after disaster when it comes to the mere survival of individuals or groups. This form of resilience would be a response to the biophysical vulnerability of humans. In psychology, resilience is often understood as emotional resistance capability, which helps us to master crisis. Martin has already mentioned research on survivors of the Nazi concentration camps. Another landmark study in this field is the research of Emmy Warner, who examined why several hundred children that faced extremely adverse socialization conditions, such as poverty, abusive households, or mentally ill mothers, were able to pull themselves out of these circumstances and uh, live a normal life as adults. Similarly, after disaster, the question arises uh, why some individuals or groups are more resilient than others in dealing with the psycho-emotional vulnerability, with shocking and potentially traumatizing experiences of disasters. Resilience in this context is not only individual mental health, but also the question of psychosocial dealing with collective stress of whole societies. We know from countless studies on disasters that both the question of survival and the question of psychosocial coping with potentially traumatizing events depend crucially on social and cultural resources. We know, for example, that people in disasters are often very altruistic and that they help each other. Um, but this depends crucially on which networks and social cohesion exists before the disaster. Research has shown that to cope with disastrous events in psychosocial terms uh, needs collective sense-making. That is, uh, collective narratives and patterns of interpretation that give meaning to a disaster. But if social networks and collective patterns of interpretation are no longer available, individual survival and mental processing of disasters becomes less likely. We must therefore always ask about the resilience of social networks, social cohesion, cultural institutions, such as values and norms. This, in our perspective, is often neglected in the discussion about resilience. In our opinion, these very different aspects of resilience are needed to understand re uh, resilience holistically and to make societies more resilient to disasters. During catastrophes and disasters, the biophysical vulnerability of humans plays a major role. It's about questions of survival and how to rescue lives. At this point, the example of the Moken, which succeeded in dealing with the wave of the tsunami should be recalled. While they survived the tsunami in this way, it became clear in retrospect that they were susceptible to the change processes of reconstruction in the aftermath, which were incompatible with their way of life. And as a result, their daily lives um, did not return to normal after uh, the disaster. After disaster, in addition uh, to physical reconstruction, psychosocial coping um, plays a major role and should not be underestimated. In our opinion, this is where the talk of bouncing back comes in, the return to everyday life after a disaster. Uh, we are thinking here about the people of the Elbe Haveland after the floods of 2013, who not only survived the flood, but also reported that their everyday life has returned to normal. As far as there are definable strategies how to master this return to normal life, we call this systematic um, resilience. Systematic in a sense that it's possible to increase the resilience by calculated actions. At the same time, however, we had to realize that although the people affected in the Elbe Haveland coped uh, with the disaster together, their trust in the state and political institutions suffered massively uh, in the years after. In a long-term perspective, therefore, social, cultural institution can always be affected or even destroyed by disasters. And once they have been destroyed, the other forms of resilience are also affected massively since their base is eroded. The social cultural resilience of collective coping capacities, social cohesion and cultural institutions is therefore most important. And we call this systemic resilience as, is, as this is the results of complex and mostly unplanned social interactions and processes. Thus, in the face of a triple vulnerability, we need a triple resilience that allows us to survive disasters, that allows us to cope with them psychologically,
and that maintains the social cultural institutions that are the basis of all disaster management. Coming to the um, pandemic, um, we think that's, that this is a good example um, for the need to understand resilience holistically. We currently see biophysical, psycho-emotional, as well as social cultural vulnerabilities. People are physically susceptible to the virus. The pandemic and the lockdown measures uh, are psychologically extremely challenging for many. And trust and political decision makers and social cohesions are coming under increasing pressures as measures to contain the virus are more and more contested. We therefore would argue that we need resilience with respect to saving human lives, resilience on the biophysical level, but we also need resilience so that people uh, suffer as little as possible from extreme emotional and psychological stress. However, all this is only possible if our social cultural institutions are resilient. Without the necessary social cohesion, the social interaction of all and resilient cultural institutions, such as norms and values, for example, it would be hardly be possible for us to protect individuals in the pandemic and also to overcome the pandemic collectively. Thank you very much. Um, and I hand back over to the presenters. Thank you so much, Martin and Daniel, for giving us so many new ways of thinking about resilience in society. I think we have so many things to discuss, and I'm very sorry that we're a little bit over time, so we don't have much time for discussion as we would hope. But I would like to hand over um, the moderation to my colleague Sebastian Bore here at um, EDDES for a brief discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I'll invite you all to turn on your camera because I'm going to ask you an open question and uh, uh, you can raise your hand if you'd like to answer. We had several questions from our uh, participants, but one thing that comes often in, in this kind of uh, forums and, and panels is basically people want to know what are kind of the similarities uh, be, that we find between maybe disasters which originate from natural hazards, uh, like we had a presentation today about the earthquake and tsunami in 2011, and the kind of disasters that comes up from pandemics, uh, such as the COVID-19. So if, you, if one of you, or maybe all of you would like to make a short point maybe about this, about this issue, uh, to help people understand a little bit how disaster specialists may cope. Yes, Professor Gawa. Yes, uh, as I showed the similarity of the disaster and disease, the, the disease becomes a disaster when it is become a worldwide or the, the more than the capacity that the one small community can cope with. That is the disaster. So the uh, WHO and the United Nations uh, regarding every type of hazards can be a cause of disaster. So the health crisis is, can be a small or large, and the health crisis like pandemic can be a disaster. So that uh, the hazard, vulnerability, and the coping capacity makes the outcome as a disaster. So that uh, I have uh, shown that the similarity of the disease and disaster. The disease needs a body to be affected, and the disaster needs a community to be affected by the hazards. So that uh, Great East Japan earthquake, it was an earthquake that created tsunami that attacked the community. And the COVID-19 is a virus and the virus attacked our community, global community. So this is a very similar and the outcome is very similar. We are losing my family, we are losing my friends and we are mentally very much stressed and we cannot go out. And, and there's a very similar situation that you, you couldn't go out when the nuclear power plant accident released a huge amount of radioactive materials in the environment. So that the, uh, the outcome is very similar, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an important, very important point to, to understand the similarities in order to be able to deal with it as a global community and, and learn from each other. Anyone else would like to uh, make a point about maybe, yes, Verena, and then maybe uh, Julia? Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very, very good question about how can we compare um, different levels of, um, of, of disasters. And um, I think there are quite a number of things that, that um, offer themselves to comparison. Comparison doesn't need to mean that it's all similar, but we can, by, by looking at certain dimensions, for example, um, uh, the threat to international networks, the shocks that are um, that are given to international networks due to uh, the pandemic or due to the disaster, both have disruptive functions. And then we can look at how uh, we can deal with this disruption and how we can build resilient structures. So in that way, I think it's a question of uh, the, the, the level of comparison. Yeah, And we certainly find enough similarities on the effects of both natural disasters and the pandemic that make this comparison really interesting. Thank you very much, Verena. If I I'm just not going to comment. I'm going to pass on straight to Julia because we, we don't have much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to come back to uh, Professor Egawa's um, comment. So um, yeah, in disaster studies, it's often uh, stressed that actually there, there is nothing like natural disasters. So for example, if we have a volcano eruption um, and nobody dies, it wouldn't be considered a disaster. But if we have a community living there and many casualties, it becomes a disaster. But um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, just like Professor Egawa said, um, it's about the coping capacities and the impact on the communities that uh, yeah, kind of becomes a simila similarity between uh, the like two types of hazards that we are talking about today. But I think a huge difference is that um, after uh, other disasters that we have addressed today, like the Great East Japan disaster, um, there was a lot of physical help and physical support by like people being there and people coming to the disaster stricken areas. And uh, like this, uh, like social support has been emphasized, emphasized as a very important point of uh, recovery, for instance. And now with the COVID-19, uh, pandemic suddenly uh, this has been restricted like people should not uh, come too close together but at the same time and this comes back uh, to our talk to resilience we see kind of creative ways how people deal with it we now have uh, like digital means to come together in a social way so in that way it's also maybe less uh, social distancing rather than uh, physical distancing but yeah, I think here's also the importance of uh, yeah, people coming together as a global community. Thank, sure. you. I think, thank you very much, Julia. I think it's a very nice point to make and to think about how, where is solidarity located in this time of crisis. And thank you very much. Any, anyone, I know that Professor Imamura kind of answered, so I invite you also to maybe look at his link. I don't know if you wanted to add something to this. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So Ala is a very important the question. So maybe we should clear the similarity and differences. Maybe one of the differences is time frame, uh, time scaling, and also physical uh, damages and the non-physical damages. So it is a big uh, issue for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to point to Professor Voss because <laughs> I, maybe you 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 maybe want to say something as well. Perhaps in uh, a twofold answer. First component is that uh, we defined the disaster once as a collapse uh, in relation to the impact to the social order, so everyday life as uh, as far it uh, the everyday expectancy about a regular. Um, structure of everyday life hasn't been impacted at all, we won't uh, call it a disaster. Uh, but as far this has really been interrupted and the strength and the impact uh, on, in this terms, in this regard, uh, that gives us an idea about the scale of the disaster. Um, the, the second component of my answer is that in Germany, we have the very special situation that the legal framework um, uh, did not, uh, within the legal framework and the responsibilities, um, uh, the, the current pandemic has not been declared a disaster. So this is why the actors on the different levels differ compared to other disasters. But this is rather because of the legal framework in behind than because of the need of practices. Uh, 
So this is actually a call for a, a revision <laughs> to think about that framework if this is really still the proper one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if there's, can I, can I make a, a statement about uh, Martin's comment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, the situation is the same in Japan. The pandemic was not regarded as a legal in a legal framework as a disaster, but uh, the pandemic also has a legal framework to cope with. So that uh, the similarity of the uh, infectious disease framework and the disaster risk reduction has a legal similarity in that sense. So that uh, we are also in the process of the. Rev uh, revising our legal uh, understand or legal uh, framework for the disaster or health crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. But maybe that's where you know the two institutions can co continue to collaborate. And I'm talking about happy, innovation. So. <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to over to Anawat, uh, Professor Anawat, for maybe introducing us to the to the next event that will be a follow up from this. And I invite everyone to to come and join us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sebastian, and, and thank you everyone for joining our session. So this will be the, the last session of today. So let me um, share the screen. Okay, so um, as a conclusion of, of today's events, um, I'm sure that you have learned a lot of things from this one and a half hour. It might be quite short, but um, I'm, I'm sure that you have learned um, broad um, fields of not only science and engineering, but also social science and, and medical science. But this is just the beginning of the what we are trying to do. Um, today, um, November 2nd, we, we, we did, did this event. But um, as you know, that the, the next March will be the memorial of the, the 10, 10 years of the Great Japan disaster. And in and, and also next next year in in June we, we plan to to organize the internal international symposium and workshop on the triple disaster of Toku and also which also integrated not only um, science engineering but also medical science and social science like like today so and also we also plan for tsunami symposium and this is right in the next year so once again if you you have a um in, interest to our events so please um follow us on the the website toku forum for creativity we will keep updating this kind of broad um cross um, field events and um so please um, feel free to, to follow us and attend the events. And last but not least um, for today, we have prepared a questionnaire. So if you have time to please give us the feedback. Okay, once again, um, thank you everyone for especially the, the all panelists uh, and the all attendants. And I, I wish you this um, information will be um, um, good for you in, in any perspective and please um, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, enjoy. Thanks a lot. Have Thanks. a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. A good night. Yep. A good day. Bye. Bye.